Hello. Hi. What up? Every loss I can reclaim. Our steps retraced from when we went. How's it going, Juice? We're live. What's going on, fam? I'm getting the echo here. Oh, that's me. That's on me. Oh, I thought it was How a voice of God. How about <laughs> Better. now? Better. Awesome. Uh, I am uh, two weeks. Yeah, the, the computer would tell you I'm not, but I'm I'm on a two-week streak of doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. Hey! Oh, wow. Yeah. That's uh, amazing, man. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I use the... They have the the blog that gives you some hints and uh you know look you look stuff up but that's how it's supposed to be um uh, but yeah so like i understand that it's one of these things where part of it is one being smart but two is like once you understand what the literal like the way they form a question right you know like there's like kind of like the sort of the, the word tricks so to speak what wouldn't be obvious to somebody who's never played with it would become more like, oh yeah, this is when they do this. I need to be looking for something in this sort of domain. Yeah, there's like um, a kind of easily not it's not unspoken because they're like they've written articles about it and stuff. But there's like a whole language of of how to read the hints that they give you. So like if it's mm. plural, then you can expect that the answer that you have to give will be plural, or if it's mm -hmm. If it's in the past, you know, or if it's like an ING sort of uh, whatever <laughs> that form of phrase is, like you can expect that your clue will be like that. You know, there's like, if it's brackets, that means it's like an onomatopoeia. If it's quotes, that means it's going to be like uh, uh, rephrasing that phrase in the same way. Um, anytime there's a question mark, that means it's like la kind of lateral thinking, like kind of a pun. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if you uh, if you do just the, the the Mondays and Tuesdays are the easiest. If you do those, like those have a lot of the same. They will reuse a lot of the same words on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, it's like or and uh, 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 and now I can't think of all the, the easy ones that they use. But they're, they're like there's there's just some words that you see a lot, but you get to see different clues that present them. So you kind of build out a, a, a kind of a multifaceted understanding of it. But it's, uh, uh, I don't know, it's cool. I uh, am getting my worth out of that year subscription of it. It's cool. <laughs> you know uh, David Kwan? Uh, not by, not immediately by name. Is he a... He's, he's, so he's a magician, he's a magi magic consultant, but I think he's written some New York Times crossword puzzles. Um, yeah. He actually has a new deck of cards out with uh, Chris Choco. Oh, cool. He's an interesting guy. He does a lot of puzzle -y sort of stuff. You might want to check out uh, is he, David I, Quant Kate. Uh, I've seen um I've seen the is he the magician who like his routine is he'll like bring people up on stage and like build out a crossword puzzle in front of everybody and it'll work? Possibly him. Sounds like him. Hey Brian. Da Dave Hello. Quant? Quan, K W A N. Oh, yeah. That's not like quantum. It's my new superhero name. Or Kawato. Kawato. Start the reaction, Quaid. <laughs> that was like watching the new Total Recall. You're kind of like, like, why? Why did you do like? Like everybody in Sosho is talented, but it's like, did you did you know it made the first one awesome? <laughs> you know, I never finished the second one, and uh, and 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 I'm trying to figure out, like, uh, uh, the girls. Uh, we did Terminator one, two, and three, and I feel like now is time to start introducing Paul Verhoeven. You know, but it's like I don't mm -hmm. know how to contextualize stuff. Uh, uh, I, I, I think they have an appetite for 20 year old social commentary. Um, I did, I did get them started in the first 20 minutes of, uh, <laughs> of Spaceballs, but unfortunately 
that consisted entirely of just the ship going across the screen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know. I, 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 it's 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 fascinating to be like a cultural curator for uh, for teenagers. Hmm. Well, you know, I think RoboCop is great because now it feels even more relevant. And yeah. particularly with the, the idea of when they're at the height of the the, the, the fear of violent crime, etc. You know, and the drug, you know, the idea is making this commentary on current times. So Robocop's certainly a good starting and, point. And, and we, we've already talked about the fact that, like, the opening scene of Robocop is where they're they're saying health care, space travel, police enforcement. These were all things that people used to think that only governments could handle. And it's like, <laughs> like living in our current world, it's like, yeah, uh, yeah, we did, we did used to think that was the case. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was about to talk about my, my, my pick. I'll, I'll save it for the picks, but I watched, I watched, I watched a lot of cool stuff over the weekend. Yeah. A lot of cool stuff. Um, I thought about Ladybird. I saw Ladybird. Uh, that won't be my pick, but Ladybird was cool. Anybody else see Ladybird? I have not seen mm -hmm. Ladybird, uh, but I heard good things about it. Yeah, that was uh, the same. That was actually I did a, a watch party watching that oh. for the first time. Doing a watch party. That was it. Was all right. You realize really quickly like how kind of like some of the barriers for watch parties are. Like uh, I watched this movie with my friend. And it's like, okay, the way it works is you need to send them a link. Well, I can't text that person a link. So now I got to email him this link or something. Um, I don't know. It was weird, weird, like little quality of life things like that. A watch party to me is like, <laughs> it sounds like a form of hell, like inviting this lot of me. Like, anybody who's ever had to sit, sit and watch a movie with me knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, I'm like, <laughs> movies to me are like Catholic mass. You know, and I'm yeah. like the strict nun. <laughs> quiet, quiet. <laughs> well, this was chat. This one was only chat or like text chat. So that ended up being okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Even text Andrew, chat? Andrew has strict uh, eating rules depending on <laughs> the content. Like random television, sure, put on random television and, and we can eat. But if it was like, when Lost was first airing or Battlestar or something, I'd come over to Andrew's place to watch it. We'd get food, and instead of almost anybody else, eh, eat the food, watch the thing. This is the fun part of it. No, there can be no, there there can be no. Uh, uh, well, you also have very sensitive ears, and so like any kind of I like, can't. yeah, like you you pick up on what uh, on on any kind of mouth sound in in a major way. Yeah. Hey, uh, I hear everything. So, uh, Justin, I don't know if you're seeing these reports that your stream is still on. Oh, it might be. Thank you. It might be. Today. Fox News there we alert. Go. Beow, beow, Justin beow, Robert beow. Young running two streams at once. Illegal stream. Yeah. Now it's ended. Doubling. Now it's ended. All right. For me, like my, I don't, I, I don't multitask, which means I can admit that I don't multitask. Unlike people who say they multitask and are really bad at it. Um, <laughs> But like I, I'm like literally like I'm in that zone, and then I'm like, what? And then I miss stuff. So that's why I'm. That's more of just my way my attention works. Is yeah. that it's I'm nutty. Everybody, I admit it. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, anything before we start? Weird things. How's everybody doing? Everybody got their drinks and the restroom breaks. Wow. I'll in? tell you mm -hmm. what. A, a Pendulet just put up on his Twitter account. Uh, the first their first big Vegas gig. 26 years, I guess. And uh, the Bally's Celebrity Room, Penn and Teller, George Carlin, Engelbert Humperdinck, Barbara Mandrell, and Anne Murray. It's <laughs> oh. a hell of a card. This is from back in the day. Yeah, his first. Yeah, 26 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's cool. I mean, that would be, if you could arrange that lineup today, that would be awesome <laughs> oh, dude yeah <laughs> that, that, that would be an epcot uh uh, uh extravaganza <laughs> seven yeah. cursed words that will bring you back to life george carlin bit um okay <clears throat> um cool well then i think we can start the show uh, everybody good yeah, yeah. feeling Wait. it oh okay oh, hold hold. Everybody hold. Hold. hold 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 the pod 
Hold the pod. Hope pod. Hope pod. Hope pod. Hope pod. Oh my goodness. All better now. Okay. Good. There we go. All right. I'm going to count you in to start in three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Back again, man. You can't stop us. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Yeah, I'm told that we are not allowed to be stopped. So yeah. Welcome back, yeah. everybody. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, so it was good. by me that told him that. So it's I, the law. I apologize. We can't control it. So. Yeah. I... I kind of feel like we need to do a segment every show, which is just called, hey, like, yeah, space is weird. We get it. Okay. <laughs> I'm with it. I'm with it. I mean, that's true, because like so many, uh, so many of, uh, of, of the United States, like, like they don't get it. They don't get it. Space oh. is weird. This is weird, y'all. Well, like, so uh, I'll bring up stuff before, like, oh, astronomers observed this. And I don't mean to trivialize these things, because often they're describing, oh, there's this galactic, there's a radio galaxy, you know, whatever it is. Like, well, it's bigger than what anything you understand or can comprehend, and it's doing a thing, but it's far off in space. And you're like, oh, that's cool. That's kind of neat. And then you find out, like, oh, here's another thing, an FRB, fast radio burst, probably comes from something bigger than anything you can imagine or know, and that's out there in space. And it's like, well, one, I am insignificant now. I really understand that. Two, space is really weird. And now I'm going to throw another weird object at you. Ready for this? Ready. Let's go. Please don't yeah. hurt me with oh. this object. Yeah. We're talking about orcs, gentlemen. Orcs. What's an orc, Andrew? An odd radio circle. Oh. <laughs> oh, I thought, okay. I got I thought he was thought, back on the yeah. menu. That yeah, no, or I, I mean, we don't know. For, I mean, we can't rule it out. But okay, odd radio circle. Okay, so there's a new paper that's coming out talking about what this is. They've observed very large, unexplained astronomical objects at a radio wavelength is highly circular and bright around its edges. As of June 26, 2020, there have been four such odd radio circles, orcs, and possibly six more observed. The observed orcs are bright at radio wavelengths, but are not visible at visible infrared or X-ray. Two of the orcs contain optical galaxies in their centers, suggesting the galaxies might have formed these objects. So, we are, yeah, we're looking at a photo. It's this big, sort of weird sort of radio burst, and there's a galaxy, and some of them right in the middle of it. I don't even know that I begin to comprehend what the hell just was if, said. If, 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 if I were to guess, I would say that what we're seeing is um, <sighs> nope, I got nothing. <laughs> I really thought I had something there. <laughs> it looks like cabbage. So, <laughs> it, now, what are the chances that it's space cabbage? Because it does look like a head of cabbage. It looks I mean, cabbage It does start with cabbage. Or lettuce. Yeah. I think it's more I, like cabbage. Also, lettuce. there looks to be a little face Right, the, face. immediately, yeah, immediately to the right of the sea here in this diagram, it oh. looks like go crazy. Like, so oh, I'm, like, I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna break it down in right. incomplete because I don't understand it. But they use the radio telescopes, they start scanning the sky, and one of the things we start seeing is we start seeing things with in radio wavelengths not visible that are that we're like, wow, there's a thing there. We can't see it on a telescope, or in some cases, hey, we we look at this galaxy. But we're picking up radio waves all around it, in this case, forming this big ring, this big ring around this galaxy. Like, there's some other phenomenon taking place there. And we're like, we don't know why that happened. We, we don't know what this is. This is this is a strange thing. So that's the weird thing, is it's a phenomenon. They're, they've observed just a handful of them, and they say that they've ruled out other things. Like, you know, you get a supernova, and you get these shock waves of matter that you're energy and matter that kind of emanate from there other things like this in this case they're looking they're like yeah we don't know and like i mean i'm like, like galaxy you know teleporting from another universe because it was about to collapse i don't know like i mean it just you know i don't really support that theory but who knows it's space is weird that's what i'm saying like yeah we get it space is weird uh, yeah okay okay as, as as long as we're just making stuff up and and Hello, welcome to the Weird Things podcast where we do that kind of thing. Like, uh, is it the weirdest thing to consider that uh, that that 
this is an almost organic beginning of an intelligence or something only instead of cell cellular based chemical environments we're dealing with uh, I don't know, bursts of energy that trigger other bursts of energy, similar to what happens in the brain. I mean, how 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 far out in left field am I? I, I I'm I'm on board for any crazy thing we want to explore. The idea that there are systems that sort of behave like that. There was a there was a I got to remember the name of the book, but there was a really cool book out that had the idea that maybe what happens inside black holes is they spin off into their own little separate universes and they take the physical laws from that other one, but they get changed slightly. In some of them, life becomes possible, some of them not. And just the whole idea that, you know, you could have, you know, universes with different physical laws is sort of an amazing idea. And the idea that this evolution, it was sort of this evolutionary idea that you could evolve universes through this process of, you know, in the universes where black holes could form. So, sure, Dude. prove us wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, I mean, Brian, to your point, like, I think that's part of it is that, like, we're using our monkey brains to try to comprehend things that, you know, function on time scales and do things in ways that we're just not quite understanding. And that's kind of like the beauty of astronomy. The beauty of the astronomy is that they go in their space telescopes out there and they see a thing, the effing size of a galaxy, of a galaxy, going, we don't know what this is. <laughs> I mean, how often do you get it, like, discover something that big or whatever? And, you know, it's kind of amazing. And and we're going to find more weird stuff. That's the thing. The, the weird things keep coming. You know, we've talked about before about FRBs, the fast radio bursts, which are these, you know, powerful, powerful radio bursts that come from spots outside of the Milky Way. And we don't quite know what they are because they don't fit, like, you know, a, a pulsar or some other aspects of what we think it could be. Damn. So, I mean, so I think, so how scared should we be? Question mark. How scared? I yeah. I think that like on, I think on that, a scale from a creaking board to an ominous knock on 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 a cabin door in the remote countryside. All the way up to a Haley Joel Osment. On the scale of a creaking board to a Haley Joel Osment, how scared yeah. should we be? I, I think think about it. Think about it being into astronomy two hundred years ago, and you know that stars. You you under you believe there's a physical explanation for it, okay? But we don't possess the physics to explain fusion and fission and the other things that, that account for that. But we we know like we know they're not. We we know they're further away than we realized. We had no idea how far away they were, but we understood that they're beyond the planets. We understand that there's some process, but all we understand is chemical processes. We don't have the language to understand it. We know there's rules to apply to it. And that's, I think, some of the things we look at now, FRBs. I think we can try to put it into our conventional language, but we maybe need another generation of physics to really understand. I suppose the big question is, like, 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 like are, are we seeing what appears to be some kind of interaction between the two? Like, like. Somebody says something and then another star reacts in some way. And I'm assuming that we've not seen that. Well, what we do have is there's we the thing that we often think about is we're used to sort of static models of stuff, a static model of the atom, a static model of the solar system, or the you know, the Milky Way poster, like, you know, you are here. What you know, our solar system's traveling around the Milky Way, right? Our solar system since life has begun on Earth has made like four or five around the entire Milky Way, which is one of the reasons why we think that life could have maybe come, could have come from just about any other star in the Milky Way. And between, even there's even trade-off of debris and material, not just, you know, between planets and between other places, there's also connections between, if you take the local group where our Milky Way is, the lines aren't sharp. You were used to like, here we are, here they are, but then you find there's little tiny or little smaller mini galaxies and little clusters of stars there and sometimes an exchange of stuff so that it is it is like a big ocean. It really is like an ocean and not just a bunch of isolated islands separated by vacuum. That's, you know, we're affected by gravity. We're affected by other things there. And we have, there are, you know, we've now starting to learn how to identify objects in our solar system that came from other places. And there may be objects in our galaxy because we've had collisions with other galaxies and ripped away stuff. And we're going to have other collisions. And that's sort of a fascinating thing to think that, like, 
you could hop onto another galaxy. Yeah, so. I guess that's that's really where where the only analog that I can have is that if you look at what we knew about the ocean in a barely seafaring, mm. you, you know, uh, level of civilization, it was probably very mysterious, right? And it only got more mysterious mm. the more we started interacting with it uh because it's mysterious now and we've mastered it right like we can we've uh -huh. built vessels that can travel faster and for longer than ever before uh and yet we are still discovering crazy insane stuff about uh the ocean and we will we will continue to do that with space as well but and to brian's question though like like or brian's point like yeah like i think the the dynamic view i think is an exciting the more we think about it as dynamic system and not just the things are moving back and forth. It's it, it opens up, and I think the more we start to think about that, you know, that is so. It's not crazy. It, I think it's more in line with my opinion. I mean, I don't, you know, you know, just I read the same stuff as everybody else, but I mean, I think like that's what excites me is the idea of like, man, things are flowing back and forth. Things are exchanging. Galaxies split apart. They come contact with each other, and we might need an entirely different system level way to look at the stuff to really understand what's taking place. All pausing for deep thought here. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I thought I thought Brian was going to say Brian had the like the, the the I was ready to say something face. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, we can bring it into the Patreon plug then because patreon.com slash weird things is where you can support this very show. Uh, each and every week, we're bringing you weird news. We're bringing you science news, the likes of which you ain't never heard in your life. And you can keep it going by heading on over there. Patreon.com slash weird things. Let me just say this. The best reason why you should get on Patreon for any show that you care about, specifically with podcasts, is that custom RSS feed. You get to put it right there in your uh, podcatcher of your choice. It is platform agnostic, and the shows come faster. You get the show as fast as we want to get paid for the show. Spoiler alert, we want to get paid very fast. So we put it up there. It hits faster than any of the uh, uh, Apple or, or uh, uh, Spotify, any of those registries update. It's direct from us to you. Check it out. Patreon.com slash weird things. So I want to segue this into a question too, because again, that's why I phrased that whole thing by the way, like, Hey, weird things in space is like, we're all like, here's the thing. My brain's too tiny to understand. <laughs> you yeah. know, I'm like, okay. All right, you know, cool. I'd be like, you know, somebody coming back in time to like a Neanderthal campfire, you know, and I'm I'm sitting there, you know, you know, trying to sharpen my rock with a stick, and they're like, you know, let me explain to you how atoms work. <laughs> uh, great. How is this relevant? This is cool, cool theory, bro. Um, there's a plan in Europe. They want to make an even bigger collider, an even bigger super collider, right? If you look at there was uh, LHC is 27 Large Hadron Collider is 27 kilometers across. There's a new one tentatively called the Future Circular Collider. <laughs> like, like they had other choice between a, between a circle, right? Right? Am I right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean they should have they should have went they, they they should have went larger hadron collider, right? Like that's that's yeah. the boss move. Our F U hard hadron collider. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not the tiny one. So this one is designed to be much larger, which allows you to sort of build up even more energetic particles to find even more things about, you know, the structure of matter. And I think these things are cool, but my frustration is that I think that a lot of reasons, the reason these projects exist is because they become, uh, basically work programs and they they basically provide send a lot of money towards contractors to build these things and a lot of money goes towards a project that a few people get to use at a time where i think if we were if it was purely about the advancement of science and you had the same amount of funding you would be spending it on a thousand smaller projects and like looking at what's going on in space it's like for the same amount of money man you could be building a heck of a lot of you know space telescopes etc up there and there's kind of an argument in physics that sort of kind of since like the Manhattan Project, the particle physicists have been the ones who have been able to kind of get the money and be able to do kind of really cool stuff because like kind of as an outgrowth of that. And they started learning how to like 
well, this is how you convince, you know, your senators or your, you know, your representatives here to give us hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to build this thing because of all the jobs. So. I, I don't know. Like, like, like I'm a fan of anybody trying to figure out more science. Right. Uh, and, and it mm -hmm. seems to me like you would want to lean into whatever it is you're good at. Uh, and, and when it comes to this situation, like, uh, look, uh, uh, Elon Musk has, has it nailed, uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, reusable space rockets, putting up hundreds of thousands of mini sats and all that stuff. So it's like, uh, I don't know. I, I, I it, it's hard for me to blame them for, for making big circles underground because they seem to know how to do that. I, I guess my point is to say that it, it, it is, if you're asking, if you're taking public funding and say, we're going to do, we want to do research because we think, you know, scientific research is great. These massive public projects suck up a ton of funding, a ton of funding that, that we get a fund. One big thing that we're finding the results, the practical application of those results are way for off. There are occasionally stuff, we do stuff like this, but it's more, we want to answer this question versus saying, should we spend, if we were to take that same money, could we divide it among a thousand different laboratories, you know, a hundred different laboratories and have amazing other sort of particles and stuff or, or other, you know, other like smaller, could we push the art of particle acceleration to build small, compact ones or things on how to do that? And I guess it's part of my, my frustration sometimes a lot of these government projects is that they, they suck up funding in one thing, which gives you limited results where if you had funded a hundred different things, maybe you would get way more science. Sure, sure. And this is oftentimes what happens with any kind of political appointment of funding is that the, the things that get funded are done for reasons that are often because they're uncontroversial or because they make headlines and and that makes the the people that gave them the money look good and if there's one thing that the large hadron collider has proven itself very adept at it is making headlines you hear about it a lot mm -hmm. it is a a science uh a, a, a science thing that gets a lot of press so i can see where somebody a politician can say oh well no one's ever going to blame me for the thing that keeps getting all uh, you know pushing the line of what we know in science forward. However, I, I do think that there is a large uh, conversation that always needs to be had about these kinds of things, especially when you're dealing with a price tag as big as what this is going to cost, Andrew. And you do have to weigh, uh, weigh it against what else you could do because sometimes it's, you know, with a lot of small grants, you can adjust and tack a little bit more nimbly than putting all your money into one gigantic program. Even if that seems at least in the minds of the politicians that are making those allocations, uh, you know, like a safer bet for them not to be embarrassed because that's really what's going through their minds. Yeah. So I, it's, I look at it where I guess the politics is what frustrates me is that I think that fusion research in the United States has not progressed as much as I think it could have because the Department of Energy decided, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were going to do the, you know, this one approach towards it called the Takamak approach. And even after some of the scientists who proposed it said we should do something different, like, no, this is the approach. You couldn't be another, if you were another agency, if you're, let's say, even the Navy, and you wanted to put more than, let's say, $20 million into an alternative program, the DOE would say, no, you can't do that. This is our purview. And so we prevented other areas of research because, you know, one government science institution said, nope, we know the way forward, which is a very, not very scientific approach, but because of the politics of it. And I think that if you, we saw this with Craig Venter when we had the Human Genome Project, you know, the Human Genome Project was uh, National Institutes of Health had funded this thing. They were using, you know, uh, laboratories around the world to sequence the human genome. And they had this roadmap for how they were going to do it and the method they were going to use it, which this very simple sort of, you know, PCR sort of method. And Craig Venter says, hey, I have a faster approach. There was this paper written on basically if you shoot DNA through a little sieve, it splits it up, you can sequence it faster and we can use supercomputers to reassemble it, we could do this thing in like a third of the amount of time and save money. And they're like, no, we, we like this approach. Inventors kind of like, we're, we're trying to like cure disease, right? <laughs> like there are people 
future lives might be saved the sooner we have this. Like, yeah, but we like this because all these labs had funding for the next 10 years, everything was in place, and they resisted it. And that's when he went off and he started Cellular Genomics, a private company that went and started sequencing the human genome on their own and started outpacing the effort of the United States government and all these labs around the world. And then they're like, oh boy, we better partner up because it's going to look really bad if this startup company beats us. And that's the thing that sort of that I wor worries me. So we get so locked into one way of doing things. On a separate, oh, yeah. on a separate track, uh, am I right in, uh, uh, it seemed like I saw a few articles over the last week saying that like uh, we are in the middle of a two week window where it's a very short trip to Mars. And so we, we, we have trips from, from, uh, 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 from China, from the United States, from the ESA, everybody uh, trying to get to Mars at the same time. Am, am I remembering that right? Yeah, the, the window is, that do we still have it's it's a, it's longer than I think it's another month or another two months or so that we have that, but that is a scary thing because like yeah we have uh, the Mars 2020 we want to launch uh, one of our big projects to there and that's sort of the scary thing that if it doesn't happen then it's another two years so uh, you know that's you know waiting on that so yeah there's a lot of people you know that's you know we've talked about this before but it's like. Uh, Every like 26 months is the optimum time to send something to Mars because it's going to have the shortest travel time. Like the a six or work. seven month trip. Yeah, I, you know, it depends. Some take sometimes it can take a couple years. Yeah, but but yeah, basically, but it's it's the most fuel efficient, optimal sort of way to do that. And if you miss that window, then you got to wait like another 26 months to do that. So yeah, there's a uh, uh, we're looking at if you go to uh, Mars. But uh, MarsNASA.gov slash Mars2020, there's you can find like launch windows, and they show launch windows up through August 15th to be able to send. The, this is the Perseverance rover that they want to send, which is pretty cool. That's going to be the first kind of like fully sort of autonomous rover. So instead of having to have to put every single command in there they can just say, hey, go look for stuff. And be like, all right, I will look for things. And it's going to start, you know, roving around and trying to find cool stuff. And is it the, uh, maybe I'm misremembering, but uh, I thought the Chinese rover was actually going to try to return like 500 grams of of Martian surface back back to uh, uh, Earth. Yeah, there there is a sample return. I don't know if that's, I don't know. Let's look that up. Uh Who's doing a current sample return mission? Um, because, yeah, that's going to be a very exciting thing. Because so far, the only Martian rocks we've been able to look at have been the ones that have hit us. Yeah. So there's we have a proposed one, but... Yeah. It looks like China maybe announced to do, some, to do a sample return in 2017 that would bring, quote, a piece of Mars back to Earth in the late 2020s. Yeah. Let's see, because um, that's another exciting thing. That's that's another kind of cool thing about space is, you know, sending robots there and getting some, you know, materials back there. So NASA ESA concept, um, China, yeah, China, as far as I know, they haven't launched anything yet. But, you know, that at some point, we're going to be able to do that, which is going to be really cool. But that's, I think, Perseverance, though, that rover, the probes, the sensors on that are even more depth than what we have before. And that's one of the things is every time we send something there on Mars, we say, this is what we can find, this is what we can't, and let's build even more sophisticated instruments there. And I think this is going to be able to go much further into the ground. This is the one that's going to have the helicopter we talked about. Yeah, the helicopter yeah. The helicopter really messes with me because it seems like on a, on, on a planet with so little atmosphere, it seems like a helicopter of all the ways to get something elevated would be the most least efficient, uh, but uh... it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I seemed like that was a thing when I read about that because you're, you're basically, you know, one percent atmosphere. It's like the same amount of atmosphere at like a hundred thousand feet altitude. But then, you know, I, I read a thing, a paper which was kind of cool, which sort of explained that well, because the gravity is forty percent, it's just right enough that a lot of things that aerodynamically, like. 
you know, in theory, you could make an airplane work on Mars. Like, and you're like, what? Like 40%. Once you get that less, you know, much, once the gravity is reduced, then your the amount of power you're getting out of thing and your, you know, your rotors are spinning faster, et cetera. But that's just, yeah, that's just, I, yeah, I would have been like, no, we'll never work. And like, oh yeah, no, we're building one, bro. I'm like, well, I'm glad I'm not in charge of NASA. So yeah. that's gonna be exciting. So we're looking at some video of this little 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 rover. It's got you know counter counter rotating uh, propellers. You know, thing pops up there and starts flying around. But yeah, do take a look at Mars Perseverance um, or the Mars 2020 mission because it is it is a really amazing. And if you ever if you ever see one of these uh, uh, rovers up close. You know, we remember when we watched, you know, the first one to land, you know, land back on Mars in the 90s, which was cool, the first moving one. And that's the, you know, smaller thing. These things are big. This is as big as like, this is as wide as like, you know, a small car. Yeah. So it's a you know, beast. The, yeah. And it's just, it's sort of neat to see, like, you think about how big this thing is. It's like, you know, we're putting a car on Mars. That was, I got to see <laughs> one of the, I, I got to see one of the, uh, uh, no, this one will work. Um, we got to see one of the um, probes that we sent that did like a flyby of like Vesta or Ceres, one of these big, and use one of these big, you know, satellite, one of these big space probes. This thing's huge. It was like the size of like a bus, you know, it was like amazing. Like the large truck is a huge truck. I'm, you're thinking something the size of a dishwasher. You see this big, you're like, this is an effing spaceship. This is yeah. a huge spaceship. There's nobody on board. And so, yeah, there's a person by scale to compare it to this. So uh, we, we saw in one of the the kind of YouTube uh, links that was to the side of uh, a demonstration of this that that helicopter would that be the first flight from Mars the first human flight or, or human engineered flight from the soil of Mars yeah yeah that would be the first object to ever lift off essentially the surface of Mars yeah uh, so you know that's that's, that's just what's pretty incredible dope. about that. Yeah. 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 We're looking at that. Like, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing. So I'm excited. I'm excited about this mission. So yeah, I hope they'll be able to take off because it's got a lot of wonderful science. They're doing a lot of cool things. They've got our system in there to be able to look at ground penetrating radar, to sort of see what's below and man, the science we'll get for back. This will be great. So. Um, and, and so do, do we know, is there any, any thought that this won't happen? This is a, this is a ULA rocket, right? That's going to put it off no, no, uh, this into is, space. Or, uh, as far as this, the, the, the waiting on this rocket, uh, I'm, this one is basically, it's, there's, it's the, one of the launch windows. So, okay. yeah, no, this is going to, this one's going to be launched on. Choo -choo -choo -choo. Okay. The, July 30th uh, to August 15th is the launch window from Cape Canaveral and then landing yeah. in February 18th, 2021. So man, Oh, that's so dope. It won't be there. It'll 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 be there fairly fast. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So uh very cool. So yeah, it'll be an Atlas V taken off from Cape Canaveral. So nice big solid rocket. It's funny if you go to the uh the, the launch page, if you go to the page where you can see the rocket, you see the the section that holds the you know the payload, the crap. There's like this big huge section compared to the rest of the rocket. So very neat. I'm um, exciting. So yeah, uh, Bryce sent me a thing today, which is cool. I had no idea this was going on, but X Prize, which X Prize is an is an amazing organization. The idea behind X Prize is uh, Peter Diamandis and the other people behind that went and they looked at one of the things that's sort of how do you inspire innovation. One of the ways you inspire innovation is with incentives, and one of the things like the reason that we had like uh, Lindbergh and a lot of your early uh, pioneers in aviation did what they did is because there were prizes to do this. You know, we had, you know, we developed like better efficient watches because there was a prize to develop a better way to keep track of your longitude, you know, when you're going across the ocean, et cetera. So X Prize says, well, let's create incentives to get people focused on a goal. And the one is right now is, Bryce, you want to take over for this? Uh, sure. Actually, Sunbun yeah. in our in our Discord uh, sent this along, but there is a new X Prize to design uh, and produce a uh, effective, more comfortable uh, face mask um, because we are, uh, you know, dealing with COVID nineteen. So, uh, one one million dollars to reimagine protective face masks by making them more comfortable, functional, accessible, and even stylish. Ooh. Oh, 
Oh. Which, by the way, that last part sounds like a uh, like a, just a sprinkle on top. But I, I I would say that stylish might be the most important of all of them. Like if 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 because uh, sty- stylish is code for uh, more likely to be worn by the casual person, right? Right. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. So I, I, you know, I had n- not considered that like the face mask needs to be, I don't know, reimagined. But I don't know. Like I guess, what I know. What oh, do you yeah. think about this? Because I, I, I don't know. I wear my mask when I go and like get fast food or if I end up in public. But um, well, think think about as we want to start to return to work and we want to be around each other and we don't want to look like we're planning a stagecoach robbery. And you want to try to find better solutions. And I was looking into this a couple months ago because I was thinking about like, man, we're, we're not going to be wearing masks like this. It's going to be hard to want to interact one-on-one with that. I'm like, man, has anybody built a transparent mask? And then I found a company called theclearmask.com. And I don't know if this works or not, but I'm like, this is kind of a cool solution here where basically what they've built is a mask where you can see the mouth. The, you, know, you can see the upper, lower part of the face and they put the filters on the side. And I don't know if it doesn't clear up or not in fog, but. Well, and, and even if it doesn't, I can imagine a mask where, um, you know, uh, where it reads your facial expressions and, and, and reveals emojis or whatever, like, like it becomes a hilarious game, you know, where it's like, well, that's... as you wink, you know, suddenly the mask puts on like a Chuck E. Cheese, like hooray, you know, look to it. I mean, all I would say is that if we are looking for, if there's a million dollar prize for comfort and stylish masks, that the first thing that I did is just Google, all right, where's the leaders of the industry? What are they wearing? What are the Tokyo streetwear people wearing? <laughs> like as, as far as masks go in terms of like, like, is there any technology that like they have or, or any the practices that they already do in a culture that is a lot more, mask uh friendly and compliant but also very fashion forward uh uh, what are what are they doing and it doesn't look like there's a a ton i mean certainly different fabrics but uh uh, nothing radically different compared to uh to what we have now yeah uh yeah well that's yeah yeah, that's why i like the i mean i don't again i don't know i'm looking at the clear mask and i don't think I don't think it's really COVID proof because it looks like on the sides and stuff, air vents out of it. But I, I like for a low tech, like a simple, cheap thing, the idea of can we figure out, you know, a, 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 do, a design where you can see the mouth. That to me is like the big thing is let me see your mouth. Let me see your pretty mouth. Let me see your mouth. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's like, it is funny how like, like just five, 10 years ago, the idea of wearing a mask was something that was about to be made illegal where it's like, what do you have to hide? We shouldn't, you know, why would you not want to show your face or whatever? Sure. Uh, and then now here we are with a, a complete reversal of that. All right. Hey, four months ago, don't wear masks. <laughs> well, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. even, yeah. even as COVID is exploding, <laughs> it's like, what's the point? Yeah. Stop it. Knock it off. We had, our, our betters, you know, in the science and health community are telling us don't wear masks, they're not going to help because they're worried about a mask shortage. And Oh, no, no masks. They're great. All right. That, uh, that, that bit I feel like I'm willing to forgive because, like, that's, that's uh, I, I believe that was fueled by a fear that there would be a run on masks and then people who... You know, we're in the healthcare industry. Uh, I, wouldn't yeah, be able to have I, it, access it's it's or... yeah. The, the 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 problem the problem was is that we didn't we didn't get to the point where I think we are now. Uh, earlier of like, hey, look, face coverings, literally yeah. a, a scarf, a thing, anything is helpful. It, it became about N95 masks and and PPE, and I think that 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 harmed the public trust by pinning it there. It's it, would, that, that, I... that's a very frustrating. Yeah, I'm not. I'm I'm in the a position that officials shouldn't lie to us, and particularly yes. about health. And, and, things and you're right. You're right. That 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 was definitely a bad play on their part. Is is trying to trying to fib a little bit so that they could keep their own. That uh, I totally agree. That was a bad move. And, uh, I, and but I think that I think that we could have done. We could have done like because like you know 
how many of you like had family members that made masks? Like when we heard mask shortage, yeah. like my mom, yeah. we know, so people were ready to step up and say, hey, mask shortage, okay, what can we do? What can we do? And that was sort of the thing that now it's this, hey, everybody, now you need to do this. And you're like, is that real or not? And it's, you know, I don't want to, I, again, I apologize. I don't want to go down a political route, but it is that it's hard because you will have parts of the population which won't be as benevolent as you are, Brian, and going like, okay, I get it. I understand why you needed to do this from a pragmatic point of view. There are now people like, no, I don't think I need them. I think the mask is a control thing. It's right. a control thing. I don't believe like, science oh, anymore. Yeah. 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 Those people already didn't believe science. Uh, it, looking at the clear mask thing, uh, <laughs> the, uh, there. so this was interesting because I assumed that that was kind of like a reusable mask. They say that the clear mask is not reusable, uh, that they are no, single yeah. use. And so like then okay so there's definitely innovation there because i think it's a cool design it makes sense and if you can make a mask that is cleanable right assuming you have some sort of clear plastic frame something that you can clean and sterilize or even just you know elbow grease I, you know uh yeah there's well, remember, still a way to go on that on that front too this is a mask but again this is this is going into the market of where we don't use in health this is health care situations like that where you don't want to use you don't want your dentist and other people using reusable masks you want them disposed because sanitary yeah. issues yeah okay so i'm sure they could make one that could it's like you want to it, go to kfc is, and wear something yeah well this is this is more like if you're go, yeah this is like a dentist office things like this if you don't want to scare your kids and that and just clearly like you know Which, by the way that look and, and not gonna not scare kids uh that yeah. that, 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 that weird grimace ugh, ugh. But you can see it, you. right? That could be happening under a mask, and and you would never see that eerie grimace with the tangle of terrifying hair uh, being close cropped behind her head. That that is that is <laughs> well, a terrifying you, sight. You wouldn't be able to see if it weren't for the clear mask. <laughs> have you? I don't mention. Have you noticed that some people have just scary eyes? <laughs> what do you mean, Andrew? Like walking down, like that. Like you walk down the street and you get some people like this. Uh, do you know? Do you know what I have noticed? Like, look at this. Is like that, happy, is that, happy guy. Ha happy guy. I, I, I like like. Okay, so um, normally when I'm wearing earbuds, listening to podcasts or audiobooks, it's like I could put on a a, a big old s eating grin for everybody around and everybody. You know, like eyes, eyes, eyes. We're all friends. That gets a lot harder when I can't hear them, and then they say something, and I don't know what they say but they also can't see my grin. They only see my beady eyes. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I've noticed that out in public, it's like, it's like a, okay, earbuds out. Hi, hi, how are you? Hi, we're talking, we're connecting via audio. How are you? <laughs> yeah, man, I, I like, uh, I'm down to just lock down any and all social cues. Like I'm, I'm going out with mask on, sunglasses earpods and a hat like i am i just you can't read me um I'm, I'm, I'm on this is like the human form of the incognito browser like <laughs> there are no i'm you're, giving off no signals you're 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 a full-on uh, uh, uh snow crash gargoyle that's it that's my perfect mask yeah i want i want just that I want a gigantic welder's mask with an LCD screen on it, and you just and and you see what I want you to see. I'll <laughs> I'll play space balls on it. I have a friend whose dad is an engineer, and he decided to make his own mask, which he basically built like a kind of a scuba mask with a hose that went to a box with a filter, but you couldn't hear. <laughs> it's a full so on dad, Darth Vader engineer. <laughs> his dad. The solution was. He put a microphone and an amplifier on the belt, so now you oh my can hear God. his voice. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. That's great. You're like, oh, jeez. I'm like, oh, God. Now, yeah, uh, that's... Hello, like, human. Like, at what point do you realize your dad was Darth Vader? Yeah. Please remain yeah. perfectly calm. I am also human. <laughs> no, I don't have a CBS card. I would not like to not sign up for one. <laughs> This is I'm my gonna, real well, voice, gonna... I swear. Anyway, around here really quick. Just please me... give me Oops, four Reese's me. peanut butter cups. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, like, I'm basically going to build, like, two, like, filters that go up my nose and shovel in the back of my throat, you know? That's going to be my yeah. solution. Like, get a mask, like... <laughs> you know, just point at my face. <laughs>
I think he's you suffocating. You should have your, have your Joker cards. Like, uh, Andrew is not <laughs> suffocating. He indeed has two filters up his nostrils and one. This is perfectly safe. It is, it is a medical condition. Yeah. yeah. Put the ADA yeah. logo on that. Have you sell that for money? Have you been following? Have you been following by the step? By the way, the the some of the research talking about the different strains of COVID. No, I'm a bit terrified because, like, I read stuff about um, uh, about long term effects long after people have COVID, uh, like like it messes them up for long term, and and I'm just like, uh, I'm gonna wait for science to figure this out and and hide. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's been. I, I'd say it's worth looking into and try to find more legitimate sort of resources. That, but the the you can look into different. Apparently, there are re some research papers, pre press papers, whatever, talking about um, different strains and COVID, which explains the infection rate being different in different places. Okay. Hmm. For instance, like we're seeing places like Arizona is having a lot more COVID infections, and people are like, "Oh, you dirty people in Arizona!" It's like. Well, there actually appears to be a strain that has this S-shaped, you know, attachment to it, which may be vicious, and it may not be the that are in place. It might be the strains of COVID, and everybody wants to wag fingers at everybody else, and we, and to Brian, like, yeah, we don't know. We don't know what's going on, and also, it's one of these reasons to go like, oh, you guys screwed up, like, yes, um, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, so uh, uh, if you are interested in this kind of research, uh, I very rarely say that you should go to Reddit to get good information, but uh, and initially when coronavirus hit, I was following a subreddit r slash coronavirus. Uh, that is basically just all of the uh, uh, articles that wind up getting circulated on social media anyway. And for at least my money uh, was a little bit too uh, uh, hyperbolic. Like it, it didn't add, it didn't make me smarter about a uh, 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 COVID, but r slash COVID-19 is basically just uh, preprints of papers. And by and large, the comments there are by people that are reading this and have a little bit less of a uh, uh, emotionally charged dialogue. And I have found that to be very helpful in kind of understanding the emerging science and indeed this is emerging science. You should know going in. I, I think Weird Things listeners will certainly know that like a lot of this stuff is us taking our best guess and it's preprint and it's yet to be peer reviewed. A lot of it might turn out to be half of something that, that uh, becomes our common knowledge on it. But if you are interested more in where the science is, uh, and not necessarily some of the uh, ramifications and the hyperbole around it, I would recommend r slash COVID-19. It is yeah. funny how how quickly I've become comfortable with it's like, uh, if, if there's only going to be three places in my world, uh, my home, my work, my convenience store, and like that's just the lap that I'm going to do every day, um, all of a sudden it's like, eh, whatever they find out, they'll find out and I'll eventually hear about it. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm shocked at how quickly I become comfortable with that lap. Yeah. I think when that's, when your livelihood is that lap, I think that yeah. it's, you know, it's when your livelihood was like, you know, our friends in the restaurant industry, our friends that had to work at another place or, or, you know, or our I have, friends I have, who are touring and so on yeah yeah you know i you know i've talked to you know tanners all, all the time now who are just trying to figure out what they're going to do next and so like yeah that's saying like i i'm in that bubble too because it's like my life hasn't been my personal life has been impacted but then i talk to my friends and people are suffering and so uh just back on the straight the thing i brought, brought up the subject of the strains it is interesting because that's one of the things that, again be mindful like as justin said papers are a thing to say hey we found a thing can anybody else find if this is true or not because we don't know. And, and we got, we put way too much weight on scientists say this, like they think they found no. this and you need several more papers to know where's, where things going. And we're trying to accelerate. We're trying to take 10 years of science and put it into, you know, a very short period of time, which there's means the noise is heavy, but the strains is one of the things that's coming out more where we're like the places that are having the bigger outbreaks, are like, Oh, there's a bigger strain. And I'll give you an example of how fast things move. Okay. There was a, uh, 
research came out a month ago, a month ago, you know, is the coronavirus mutating? Yes, but here's why you don't need to panic. And they talked about how they're de developing, detecting different strains. And normally over the life cycle of a virus is life viruses might be pretty, uh, viruses tend to be pretty dangerous in the beginning, but that's not really good for the life of the virus. Eventually reach a point where they're a lot more sort of benign or the symptoms are mild and you get things that would have killed you that eventually become like the cold. Right. And they become more violent, but they become less deadly. And that's kind of what maybe five years from now this may become. But we're seeing it becoming way more violent, much easier to spread. But, you know, the it doesn't the damage, it doesn't, it's not becoming more dangerous. But this article was like, it's funny because this is like six weeks ago, like, hey, yeah, it's mutating, but don't worry, this is normal. And now we are six weeks later, hey, a lot more people are infected because apparently it mutated virally. And so it's like, hey, yeah, guess, but and, and it's, then on it's, top it's, of that, it's, it's there's, emerging, there's, emerging, emerging, emerging. Right. That's, well, that's and, the big and, and there's also the fact that that behaviors have changed and, you know, uh, there's been a, oh, a, well, certain holidays and, and the suspicion that now that it's warm, we'll be OK or whatever. Yeah, no, very true. That's what people were. That's what you. That's the public. Everything. Oh, it's because you know the, these people here. They didn't. They didn't follow this. And like, yes, and now it also looks like this is a different strain. And so maybe it's not just the behavior part because there is. We were baffled by in other countries, like in Asia, there seems to be a less violent strain. Which, you know, like, thank goodness because in some countries there, the population density, if it had been more violent and more dangerous, you know, the cost of human life could be even worse than it is now. And so you know that's kind of a lucky break so far and we you know hope it stays the same but uh that is one of the things that it's hard because we're trying to figure things out on a moving target you know it's a ch constantly changing thing yeah so. sleep so, well everybody so who hey. wants to talk about things we're consuming <laughs> uh hey i got i got a pick for you um uh, two things you're i'm gonna have the same picks as as the last few weeks uh, I'll do the expanse first. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for my other one for after things, but, uh, the expanse, boy, do I like the expanse. How it's far? a good show. How far in? Uh, we're into season two now, okay. late into season two. Yeah. Um, but really what I had always thought of the expanse was kind of a, a, a great BSG, like something that will scratch that BS that Battlestar Galactica itch. But really what I'm finding is that it's a lot more scratching the game of Thrones itch. It's the first time that I've watched a show since game of Thrones that I really have faith in its expansive world building and its confidence in sort of rotating in and out who the main characters are because the world is indeed so vast uh, uh and and the the issues continue to kind of ramp up and up as mysteries resolve they become more complicated and therefore you can confidently move forward with new and exciting stuff so uh, i am enjoying it thus far uh you know what game of thrones is a good parallel for um we we just wrapped up uh, uh the last of us part two uh, and keep in mind, it's been me and my 12-year-old daughter. Uh, and yes, I know it's a mature title, but she's a mature girl. Um, the uh, uh, one thing that Game of Thrones has always been very, very good at is telling a simple story that increasingly got more and more complicated. And boy, do you feel that in, in The Last of Us. Uh, 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 being as safe as I can, um, there's somebody who's upset and has a list of people to exact revenge upon, uh, and only after exacting revenge do you spend the rest of the game experiencing life from the other side of the people who had revenge exacted upon them. And, uh, and ultimately, uh, if I were to summarize, Part two becomes a, a, a treatise, a, a thesis, uh, reminding us that, um, that revenge is a circle that goes nowhere, and it takes a courageous person to break the cycle of revenge, and, um, and you experience that, and, uh, and I loved it 
very, very much. It's heavy and it's hard. And when it was over, there was 20 full minutes of me and my 12 year old daughter, just, just watching the credits before either of us said a word. It's wonderful. It's, it's very, very good. Cool. Uh, how, uh, how long did it, did it, did it take you guys about? Um, Cause I know I, you've been playing uh, the past few weeks. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 20 hours. Okay. Uh, if I were to, if I were to guess. That's yeah. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. It, it, um, um, the, uh, there were multiple moments it, it, as with a long game. Uh, there's a few moments where like, Oh, this is the peaceful off ramp where we can decide it's all over. And then, and then instead characters say, I can't take this peaceful off ramp. I have to finish the thing. And you're like, I guess we're back on it again. Um, but it's it's wonderful. Very, very good. Cool. Uh, I got a pick. Uh, this is a new movie on Hulu. It came out uh, this week. Uh, it's Andy Samberg and Kristen Milioti. It's the time loop uh, rom-com Palm Springs. Man, this is a good movie. Good God. Um, so basically... Uh, uh, Miliati's character is at a wedding, uh, and uh, 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 meets Andy Samberg and uh, ends up following him to a cave, uh, where she gets thrown into this time loop, uh, where he's been stuck for kind of an, an, a, a long unknown amount of time. Um, uh, but it's it's great. They have a really good chemistry. There's a lot of of funny bits jk simmons is in this and he's got a great sort of minor role um i i think this is it it's just mwah, chef's kiss great um nice yeah palm springs is, it, is 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 there a darkness to it or is it just playful or uh it uh it's it, i mean it has it, it has like some it has some dramatic beats right um uh, but Oh, but it's kind of a relationship movie, right? Like what is when you're stuck in a time loop with more than one person, what do you what do you do for, you know, all of time? Um, and that so, and so, that so vi vibes of Russian doll or or um, uh, it's, uh, no, because Russian doll has that whole like meta level of the time loop deteriorating and stuff. Um, in fact, the way that they decide to conclude this movie is is weird and very hand wavy, but it's 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 fun. Uh, Paul Springs on Hulu. Andrew, uh -oh. you you uh -oh. are muted yourself. Andrew. Muted, 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 muted. We got it. Yes, I had you guys muted too because uh, when. I have something on my list. I'm like, I'm going to tune out of this conversation for right now because I, I want to have a surprise. Okay. Um, so my pick is going to be uh, one of the things I love, and I talked about this before, and I'm sort of a broken record on this, but there is so much wonderful knowledge and information out there on YouTube. If you look, there are people who are, and particularly it's often it's, you know, 23 year olds explaining things extremely well and eloquently. And I've got a number of YouTube channels that I follow that I learn a lot from. You know, I've talked before about Defunct Land, which is, you know, just a great one about theme so parks good. and Disney. Did you see the one about Freedom Land USA? Uh, no, I, I, I think I've held that off. Like, like I, I, I in fact, they're so tasty that I, I save them in batches so that I can mm -hmm. really enjoy them. So that that this won't be my pick, but they did one on back in like the 60s, some people who were instrumental in creating Disneyland. Some of the people who helped build Disneyland from like one of the, you know, the, the chief operations managers, some other people, some big Disney people left Disney, went to New York and decided to build a theme park there that was basically Disney level quality. OK, this was they brought in the same companies that build the Disney attractions and stuff. And they had some rides, like there was a Pirates ride before Disney had a Pirates ride. They had some other kind of really cool stuff there that, like, you know, you look at this Freedom Land USA, and it looked like an amazing park. A lot of people thought it was as good as Disneyland, and it was sort of like this bizarro Disneyland kind of thing. And the only problem was they built it in New York, which is a bit seasonal, and so it had to shut down during the winter times and they needed to have a really high number of people going in there. And so, and it was like in the Bronx, 
which is now this big, massive, humongous housing projects there. But once upon a time, there was kind of a Disneyland 2.0 there. So, wow. uh, Freedom Land USA. So that's one of the defunct land uh, things. But uh, the pick I want to pick is the YouTube channel Company Man, which is basically uh, what this is, is the sort of uh, deep dives into companies, like what made them successful, why did they fail, et cetera. And I think they're really neat sort of analysis. These things are maybe like 15 you know, minutes long. They're not too long, but if you want to find out about solo cups or things like this, you know, Toys R Us, where do they get their start? You know, why do they decline? And I find these things better than like, you know, CNBC documentaries or stuff like this. I think they do a really good job of basically taking a topic and are, you know, a lot of cable channels try to make documentaries like this and they're nowhere near as formative or well-researched as these are. That's awesome. So company man, company yeah. man, if we're looking for, yeah. If you're looking for other stuff, it's just really cool. Like 10 to 15 minute deep dives into this company. And you know, there's a couple of ones I'll be recommending later on in some other episodes too. There's just a lot of really good documentary makers on YouTube, just going no, so narrow, but, and so well, and then carrying the knowledge from one place to the better. And it's better, better than like people, you know, are doing on cable. So, yeah. yeah. Turns out that when you don't have to have a commercial break every 13 minutes, <laughs> you got a little more freedom to, to tell the story directly. Hmm. Well, and also like when you have somebody who's really passionate about making it too, cause like a lot of those things are, Oh, you know, we, we want to do a thing on Microsoft. Oh, okay. I, you know, we'll, we'll write a thing today and we'll go do this. We'll just pull the surf, you know, pull our research from Wikipedia and whatever. And that's it. You're, we're not going to have a researcher go do a deep dive into it and, that's why a lot of those things sort of suffer. Like I've always been disappointed when, you know, a lot of the cable doc business documentaries, I go watch them. Like, this is everything you already know about the company. Nobody right. did that. Where do you take defunct land? Like I thought I knew Disney history. You know, I'd read biographies of Walt Disney and stuff and there's stuff in there. Like I never knew cause he's going deep and lateral and, you know, pulling stuff out. So, well, and, and, uh, and also man. finding material from um, uh, uh, lateral is a good word because he goes out to uh, uh, the same level he's on to find uh, somebody out there on YouTube has posted uh, Astro World's Sky Screamer video or whatever. It's like, like, like that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that, that most of the, of, the, of the quote unquote deep dive CNBC folks are not gonna bother to, to plumb those depths. Yeah, absolutely. So gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey, there we go. All right. I can show you guys. All right. We'll get ready for after things here in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you guys want to talk about in after things? What do you want to talk about? I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, Brian, if you wanted to talk about, uh, I know you just put up the new, uh, the new product that you sent me the, 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 the trailer for, but I thought that was a very interesting way to kind of paint, uh, you know, a, a problem kind of red and, and if you wanted to get into like yeah, kind of when, well, and, when, and when you guys bought that and, and now trying to figure out the new way that you're going to sell yeah, so, it. So, so what happens when you think you have a genius idea and then the world comes at you and how do you plan to deal with it afterwards? That might be a good discussion. Yeah. Plus, we get to show the video, <laughs> which I think is very funny. Uh, it's a cool. very funny right, video. Right. Uh, yeah, let's let's take two. Right, let's a little bit of stuff here. Oh, let me just use it while we while we take our two. Yeah. Uh yeah. Justin. What's up, dude? Uh have you gotten on that one hundred gex chain train? One hundred gex, no. One hundred I have not. Um they're they're a uh 
a duo. They're a band. Okay. Uh, and it's I've 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 I just it's it's bizarre and it's genre bend genre bending genre hopping. Okay. Um, and it's it's incredible. I don't know. So they have like they put out an EP or not even an EP like an LP last year called 1000 Gex. Okay. <laughs> and um, what is this? Oh no, this was May. This was back in May. Um, and like, uh, so it's only a, a few songs. Um, and uh, but it's only like 23 minutes. This this release, and it's like blown up on TikTok a little bit because it's kind of alt poppy meets like noise music. Okay. With like this really like interesting influence down the middle of like um like pop punk and like emo music i mean spoiler alert so uh, one of the albums that i did listen to over the weekend was uh the the posthumous juice world uh oh. album uh and like spoiler alert if you like emo music like emo music never died it became trap like you know and and juice world mm -hmm. was really at the forefront of that but like yeah pop punk and emo like if you uh, across so many genres like the the progressions and the sound is is there like you know mm -hmm. a, a blink 182 and my chemical romance are like among the two most influential bands in modern music in 2020 yeah so uh so i'm i'm on my run i'm on that long run i took over the weekend and i'm i listen, so I listen yeah. to that that lp uh is like 20 minutes pretty cool like kind of poppy kind of got some hip-hop stuff like some interesting callbacks to like 90s hardcore music and like um like no guitars style like pop club music yeah um but then they just had this remix album come out last week, and one of the one of the songs uh, on that is like half. It's like because it's like that weird thing of like a remix where they they change everything, like including the vocalists. And, gotcha. Uh, so one of the songs, like Fall Out Boy, just does uh, one of their songs. Just like hey, really? It's we're just Fall Out Boy. We're just doing the song, and so you hear it with through that lens and you're like oh my god this is just like <laughs> they just they, like the the it, i don't know it blew the doors open for me in terms of uh, oh my god realizing yeah, no, that influence like, honestly you like listen to that juice world album and you're like there's it's the same it's mm -hmm. literally the same vocal pattern like yeah. it, it's just the like even it's like well, even, uh, um, it's like amazing on uh, on that new Lady Gaga album, which is like very house music inspired. Um, Skrillex is a producer and writer on one of those songs. And after all of the, uh, like seeing that link over there, I was like, could you sing like this Skrillex song like as an emo song? And it like totally works. Like it would. Yeah. Because he used to be in uh, an emo band um, before he was a, a electronic Skrillex. producer. Yeah. Um, but it's I don't know it's so cool. But then I'll check out I'll check like, out a hundred gex. Check it out. I'll get I'll get I'll get the gex. That here here is a list of things that are on that album. Fallout Boy, yeah. uh, Caro Caro Benito, which is like this very char this very cute like indie pop songstress, uh, and like my a song with Minecraft references. Like just okay. there's a lot of stuff going on. It's, it's really it's tied cool. into the kids. It's for the yeah. kids, you know, for kids. The uh, that 20 minute that LP has a ska song on it, just like in the middle of it. There's just a ska song. Here's just we're doing ska. And it's and uh, it's, it's fucking awesome. It's, it, and it's good. It's it's great. It's super cool. Yeah. I don't know. All right, I'll get the gex. Let we're we're talking about the 100 gex, gex, Brian. Are you down with 100 gex, Bry? I'm not down. I feel like 99 tops. No way. Mm hmm. You know, that thing that struck me about musical influence was that, like, you kind of have things that seem so unrelated, then you find out somebody liked this, and then you go back and you listen to it, was, because mm -hmm. I was big into Nine Inch Nails and Trent Reznor, and then I heard him, you know, mention something about, like, some connection to, like, Devo, 
And I used to love Devo when I was young. And then you go back and you listen to Devo and Nine Inch Nails, and you're like, holy crap. Like, there is a lot of the same sort of, like, you know, kind of, there's, like, connections between things you often don't think about. Like, you look at, like, mm-hmm. like why, you know, why is craft work? Why was that considered such an influential band? And then you listen to sort of a lot of the stuff that worked its way into other stuff. And you're like, oh, I get it. Like, some things kind of, yeah. lay down like kind of viral DNA and other things. Well, and with how fast music production has got and how like kind of widened out the whole field has become, like you can have this this, you know, this LP that came out in May, or I guess that was May of last year actually, now that I think about it. Um you know, a year ago and then a year later Fall Out Boy, it, like you could say like, oh yeah, Fall Out Boy influenced us in this track. And then they do a song on the remix. Like they, Fall Out Boy does a remix on the album. Like I, I feel like in that same Nine Inch Nails Devo thing, like you probably wouldn't have gotten a Devo Nine Inch Nails collaboration uh, uh, be, because I don't know, it just, things seemed so much more siloed off, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. There's a, yeah, the, it's back to the deal. Like, yeah, I was trying to find the source. Rolling Stone, Trent Reznor, the Nine Inch, Nine Le- yeah, Nine, Inch, Nine Inch Nails leader worships Devo. And that was just that when I'm reading that, like, now these things are connected and you find other stuff. It's like, you know, Billie Eilish, where you're like, she doesn't want to be one genre, but you just see she's like a lot of people. Like, I listen to a lot of stuff and that's what the music is going to be. And, yeah. you know, I'm a big fan of just do whatever the F you want. You know, yeah, you want to do a spa also- song next, do that, you know. Yeah, there's there's a lot less pressure on it now too because uh, you know a album releases can be asynchronous. You're not really like timing it necessarily for the summer or season. Artists have multiple releases or mixtapes or singles throughout the years now, uh, and is, is, you know, is the, this, the, the pressure on the album isn't isn't the same that it ever used to be. Is this playlist culture? Is that what this is now? Is because of like the Partly. iPod age where you just put everything on there? You know, I mean, a lot of a lot of it is also uh, you need curiosity to break things through. If things are too samey, 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 then you're not going to get the same kind of uh, uh, curiosity and interaction. And certainly in in some genres, uh, you want that. You want the, uh, the 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 random track because you want people to listen to the whole album. Like there's a whole science now of like exactly how long the the most streamable album length is the fact that like songs are actually getting shorter because you get paid or per full play track yeah. yeah uh yeah yeah you get paid yeah you get paid more if they get through the entire accounts differently if you get through the entire album so the albums are becoming kind of shorter but people are putting more of them out that now it's not crazy to think of a, a band or an artist having multiple albums you know maybe they call them different things uh you know, in in a year yeah mixtapes or or whatever yeah. so it's fascinating but i i think in terms of creativity especially for major artists major artists like beyonce could do a alt rock record and it would be massive and that would not be an option for her you know even 10 15 years ago yeah um but you should check them out you're gonna i think you're gonna like them juice i'm on the gex i i I, I, I downloaded the the uh, i'm gonna listen to the first album because i assume it'll it'll make the remix album a better listening experience oh yeah by far yeah chris hayes was too soon you hear that garth brooks (laughs) yeah right yeah yeah oh no totally chris Chris Gaines, Gaines, right Gaines. Gaines. yeah chris Gaines. sorry that was his other thing (laughs) that's a test yeah nerds this is underwear pseudonym how did you? How did you there? No. All right, you guys uh, ready to do some after things? Yeah. Let's do it. Yep. All right, then I'm going to count you and Andrew in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Maind, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everyone. So, gentlemen, I understand that we are going to talk about <laughs> about <laughs> trying to release a product at the wrong time, about about investing months and months of development and refinement, and then discovering that by the time you're ready to put it out, it's the exact wrong time to do it, and whether or not you just hold on to it or figure out a clever way to do it. Uh, first, a uh, bit of backstory. We'll have to explain some uh magic inside stuff 
most magicians are familiar with a product called the hot rod where uh, you have a, 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 a six different gems. You have somebody choose the number and uh, you land on a gem. And then uh, 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 despite the fact that the gems are on both sides, all of a sudden you do a magical move and all of the gems are the same on both sides, right? Uh, that's, not, that's not giving away too much, right, Andrew? Nope. Okay, nope. so uh, uh, there's a technique to it, and we got a friend of the show, Alex Rangel, to say, hey, what if you did that with a lottery ticket? And uh, he sketched out a plot for it, uh, and the, the plot would be exact same technique, exact same trick. Uh, the, uh, the, the winner would be a hug. It would be one of those like uh, fake lottery tickets where everyone's a winner. It just mattered how much you won. So uh, the winner was a hug. And then, uh, and then you found out, uh, oh, oh, what were some of the other things you could have won? And, uh, and of course, all of them are like billions of times better than a hug. And uh, in a world uh, four months, five months after we got everything figured out and printed, reprinted because we had problems with the printing and all that, we were in the middle of, uh, of COVID. So it's like, so let me get this straight. The whole purpose of this thing is to trade a definite winner lottery ticket for a drink so that you would feel like you came out ahead. Also, the fake prize was a hug, which is a thing that you cannot do in public anymore. Uh, so so how, how do you work with that? And uh, we, we, we just decided to lean all the way into it. And instead, we sort of did this fusion of, of, of uh, uh, well, right here, if, if you want to play the whole thing, we can we can describe it from the beginning. Oh, the whole but, video. Yeah, yeah. Go. Uh, so, so. Well, yeah, we, we can. Yeah, we can. We can. Uh, uh, we would encourage. Where? Where? Which channel is it up on? It's on uh, uh, youtubecom scam school. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's actually skip skip to the middle here a little bit, just because I uh, uh, it is it, it's a great video, but it's definitely five minutes long. So uh, you uh, it opens in 2020, it then flashes back to 2019. Uh, to a world in which uh, you and David Rowan, who uh, helps you run the store, are having your your initial uh, your initial brainstorming meeting. Yeah. So you just provided a whole bunch of entertainment value, and now is the part where you get to cash it in. Exactly. You know those novelty lotto tickets where every scratch off's a winner? Yeah, I got one of those for Christmas once. Imagine using this to score that free drink. I mean, maybe, but. This looks like it costs $5. It's got a dollar sign and everything. Maybe it's $5, or maybe it's something spectacular. Why don't you get me the next round and I'll give you whatever prize you win? I mean, a drink is just a drink, but this lottery ticket could be anything. It could be anything. What can I get you? Manhattan. I definitely come back with a white claw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, after and giving so, him a judging Manhattan. look. So, so, so by the way, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the video is, yeah, the video is rife with you and and David touching each other's face and oh, yeah. switching drinks and like all things that are like totally, totally, totally oh, yeah, verboten yeah, yeah, yeah. in our modern so year uh, of of COVID. But what I was uh, curious, Brian, number one, what was the time frame on you developing this, and at what point are you business wise like up against it to decide? All right, do we hold this? Do we we wait, you know, until uh uh you don't have to hang a a hat on the fact that this is basically contraband in our modern world? Yeah, uh, what, we, what, uh, what what was that what was that process? I think we started it 8 months ago. And by the way, we're just watching video of me and and, and David just practically making out. Uh but the uh uh, uh, yeah, we started it eight months ago and then the first round that got printed were misprinted. So we we're like, no, 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 they're the wrong size. And, and, uh, one of the clever things that we did on this was put on the back of it, um, a bit of, of extra guidance to, uh, because the hot rod force, if you're familiar with it, uh, has problems in that you have to suddenly justify weird moves. Uh, uh, so, so we actually wrote them into the instructions on the back so they flow fairly nicely uh but um 
uh, everything got kind of put on pause two or three months ago. And then at some point it was like, you know what? Let's just own that this is the weird place we're in right now. And uh, I, 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 I don't know. I'm happy with what we come out with. I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, uh, is there was there a thought of no, we're going to delay this? Like, 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 let's let's even if we have to punt it a year. Was that was that in your mind, or is it like, hey, look, no, we 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 laid out what we were doing in 2020, and this is you got to keep the wheels moving. Uh, you got to roll with it. No, there was sort of um. There was sort of a two to three month period where very clearly it was like, uh, okay, nobody's selling anything. Nobody wants to buy anything. Everybody's laying low. We're being quiet. Nobody wants to hear about, you know, the party at the bar or whatever. Uh, so we, we just kept our mouth shut. And, and only recently did it feel like after a, a Memorial Day or going into 4th of July, was it like, okay, could we even acknowledge that there's such a thing as parties? And uh, uh, and so even then we're doing it with a wink and a nod at this point. Uh, yo, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to paint it red, right? And that's what, you know, spoiler alert to the, to the uh, uh, commercial, which I would encourage everybody to read. It then goes back to Brian in 2020 in a hazmat suit as he is now debating, uh, you know, how to sell this with a... Uh, with hilarious, hilarious results of, uh, you know, just loudly cursing, bleeped cursing. Um, well, well, and spe specifically, the way that we wrote that in there was we were acting as though we'll be able to sell 20 of these for $100 each. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. And so, and then the, the big reveal is that you can get 25 tickets for nineteen ninety nine. Uh, and so, uh, but it's, 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 it's a fine trick. And it's good, but uh, I, I mean, at some point, it's like, you know, we bought the damn things. We have to own them. We have to move them. Uh, so, so I don't know. Did, did you feel more pressure to make a video like that? Did you feel more pressure on the messaging than you would a, a, a random uh, a product launch where you're just kind of selling, hey, it's a cool magic trick. You trust us because we sell cool magic tricks. Yeah, because I I didn't I didn't feel like for a good two months it was appropriate for us to be selling anything full stop. Like I felt like everyone was kind of kind of you know in lockdown, scared, not going outside, that kind of stuff. And it's like, I'm not going to be the one saying like, don't worry about it, gang, go on out, do a thing. So uh, by couching it in sort of a different time, I felt like we got away with a little bit of, uh, of, 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 of silliness on there. And yeah, I guess you do there have is... to sell the silliness. Yeah, there's that trying to figure out like, because there's how do we adjust to where we are right now? And then how do we adjust to the future? And so... You know, I'm doing revisions on a novel, and the novel's set like two years from now. And and I've had I is written pre-COVID, but it wasn't too hard for me to then. And but it was pre-COVID, but I kind of had set it in sort of a situation where stuff had happened in the world, so it was able to. But still, even then, was like you know, my editors going in there like, "Will people shake hands?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I I don't know. You know, like I, it's a very good question. Like, will this happen here? Will this happen even if it's two years from now?" And and trying to think of like, how do I plan for next year? You know, how do I plan ahead? You know, and, and magic, as we talked about weird things a bit, was live performers are struggling because there's just no live performing right now. And but even when we're back to it, you know, what will material look like and just social conventions, et cetera? Yeah, you know, we don't have any answers. <laughs> no, and, and, and I guess it's a bit of a bummer that the that the that the booby prize is a hug. Cause even that you can't do, you know, like at the, yeah, very, at yeah. the very least mm -hmm. there was a time where it's like a hug would be fine and everybody would be happy to get or receive a hug. Uh, so we, we oh. put that video out on Friday, it's Monday and there was an, an email blast. I, I know it's very early, but what are some, what is it? What does the forecast look like on the, this lotto ticket product? Um, it's, it's underperforming in terms of number of units bought, but we've we figured out that just because something doesn't go nuts the moment we put it out doesn't necessarily mean that it that it that it doesn't have value for years to come. Because uh, it's not gonna spoil. Right, exactly. 
like that's like small. Like, and, and, and you know, we do mystery boxes and bundles and packages yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but but it, it's interesting to try to stay as flexible as we can. Uh, and and I suppose if there's a lesson, it's that um, uh, own own the reality and and don't deny what's what's happening and how you got there that's that's what we're currently operating under so uh i know pre covid there had been like a lot of products in development i don't even know the specifics on a lot of them uh are where are we at like how, what's our pace going to look like even still right i mean we're still in the middle of this i guess it's dependent on the product but um um Ooh, are you talking about like just like in general i guess for the store. releases or yeah i mean not specifics but like you mentioned like there was a you know the few per- few months where you didn't really want to be selling anything um uh, how is that that steering changed now in in july um i would say right now at any given time sort of different verticals are 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 more popular than others so I would say going in into the next couple of months, uh, we're going to, uh, one thing we've never done is a, uh, modern rogue mystery box, mm-hmm. uh, which would allow us to revisit, you know, a, a gentleman warrior scoundrel and, uh, and, and also we can make sticker versions of all of the various t-shirt designs that we've done. So, uh, so we could do a a modern rogue themed mystery box. Oh, just broadly speaking. So we so we're gonna we're we're the store is back. O- the store is open. We're oh yeah. Products and, are coming uh, out of the fa- factory. Right, and and, and we have to be. I mean, it's like otherwise we're we're in a bit of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, is there any? I mean, part of what makes that trick specifically hard to sell in our modern era is that. Uh, it does, it requires and is built on a social moment, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas something else, you know, that, that might be, you would want to practice, right? Like that is something that would seem to sell more into the modern moment because it's like, well, you ain't got something to do. You ain't got something to do. You might as well sit in your mirror and and work on, you know, some uh, a part of making this uh, a trick better. Whereas like, this particular situation you you don't i mean spoiler alert uh uh you know without getting into the magic principle it's it's not rocket science like you know you can you a, a lay person can figure it out fairly quickly as it's a uh, uh you know explained to you correct so 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 the problem that we were trying to solve is that um anytime you have a consumable for a magic trick what you don't want to do is have people buy, I don't know, 20 of them. And then every time they're about to do it, think like, oh, is this one of the 20 coupons I want to spend on doing this magic trick or whatever? But once we realize that we could position it against um, getting a free drink, it's like, well, then, yeah, you know, it costs you 89 cents a pop. And then and then you get a $7 Manhattan or whatever, uh, then, yes. By all means, you'll use it as as much as you want, and you'll feel very good refilling it. Um, uh, and that's just not the reality that we live in anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it is. No, it is not. But I thought you did. Uh, you did a, a very admirable job. Uh, you know, under adverse circumstances with that product. Yeah. Brian, magic postcards. Magic postcards. We'll talk. Okay. Yeah. All right. right on. Right on. Greetings from the Bermuda Triangle. What? Oh! What? I love that idea. But that's that's. <laughs> I think that's a thing you could do though. Is like because like the idea of the beautiful thing with the lottery ticket from a merchandising point of view is that it's a consumable. Yes. You know, and yeah. that's that's a thing that's cool. You know about those kinds of tricks. Like, oh, I love them. I gotta order more. Mm. You've got me. Well, and, uh-huh. and and that was the part that I thought we had solved in in that like uh, every time you use one, you're you're spending a you know an eighty you know eighty cent whatever, but you're getting a seven dollar you know cocktail in exchange for it, and uh, and then all of a sudden bars went away. Yeah, but like it's it's uh, it's good that the lottery ticket is not like there's nothing about it on the actual item that is like talks about getting a drink or talks about being at a bar, right? Like 
they, I bet people can come up with creative ways to, uh, I don't know, to, to, to get value out of it. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. I got, although I did particularly agree the moment, uh, uh, I love the moment that David is like, uh, well, because it's 2019, a luxury clu- cruise is safe and fun, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, like we just, we just, no, you know. there are, there are some, some uniquely like you, you would not be able to, with a straight face, try to sell this product in 2020 without explaining almost like what a parody of like bad ideas are are involved like the 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 like booby prize as you mentioned is a hug and then there's a cruise and stuff like that and it's like ah you want to know what eventually we hope that the world looks like it looked before <laughs> so screw it look it's there uh 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 you know go ahead and get it at, a, at an awesome price it's but a chevy I, cruise i, 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 I it's guess yeah, i guess if there's a lesson the lesson is um that uh, no, they're not moving as fast as we would like right now, but that doesn't mean that they lose value. In fact, if anything, they, they ferment and, uh, they become part of bundles and surprise packages and mystery boxes down, down the road, uh, or at least that's the, the hope for all of that. Do we want to do picks? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I got, I got a brief pick. I was talking about this between the shows, but uh, uh, there's a really great album out. Um, uh, this album actually came out last year, but they have a new remix album, which is a very good reason to go listen to the original. It's on streaming, and you can you can buy it. It's called 1000 Gex, G-E-C-S, by 100 Gex, G-E-C-S. Uh, <laughs> it's great. It's, it's, it's wacky, and um, I can tell you that the band is like a noise pop band, but the album is not noise pop because there's emo rock and there's a ska there is a a jokey ska song in the middle of it it's got hip-hop stuff uh, it's it's very cool and it's only like 20 minutes i highly recommend it because it's 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 out there man it's just it's out there and I, <laughs> I, I you could i was joking with someone else on twitter about it i was like you can write an entire dissertation how you go from this 20 minute lp to the remix album of this lp having fallout boy doing a song doing a fallout boy sounding song on it um it's it's super cool and super weird check it out uh bryce i gotta ask you a question okay because partly on your enthusiasm i started watching the show search party ah yeah and i have very much enjoyed search party up through the end of the first season okay now uh I'm now two episodes into season two. Um, and I, I have found myself. All right. I'm going to try not to, to, to get into the spoilers, but what I love the most about the show was that it was a show about very, very flawed people, often mockable kind of archetypes of, a uh, latter millennial New York City. Um, and there was this awesome whodunit. And mm-hmm. the way that they resolved the whodunit was very on brand and very fun. But earmuffs, if you don't want to be spoiled, the continuing conflict becomes these horrible people doing something truly horrible right at which point i'm kind of not into that show i Um, like the show where they're like a a a gang that can't shoot straight in this world and there is a mystery and i really kind of liked the world that had been created and whether or not every little bit of it is everything that we thought that's fine uh i just it took it from Oh, ha ha, these horrible people do horrible things until they do something that is truly vile. And I'm like, oh, now I don't know if I want to root for these people anymore. I, I've just been, I, I was kind of cold on how they didn't resolve uh, things, uh, you know, going forward. It just felt like a different show. So my question to you, Bryce, okay. is does it get to be more like season one or is this season two direction? 
that is very much what the show is through this and and I guess the third season. Yeah, season two and season three deal a lot with the thing that you we're talking about at the end of season one. And yeah. uh, it never kind of gets over the pallor of the gravity of the various things that happen. Um, yeah. And all right. And so I, I, I it definitely kind of changes the tone when you go from like a, a annoying bad people doing annoying bad people things to annoying bad people do awful horrible thing. Um, that dynamic changes, but especially season eight, maybe even just skip season two and go to season three if like if you're really having a tough time with it because season three the conceit or the I don't know, the main arc of season three is like here is a magnifying glass on all of the awful things that you did um yeah so, i guess i don't know I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. yeah we'll see we'll see how much i want to stick with it but uh okay. i love that cast and really it was one of those things i don't know if it's if it's like this for for other people but like man uh i was you know uh, uh really 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 into this gang that can't shoot straight trying to crack the case and uh and boy when that got ripped away from me i was not particularly pleased because that's what i was showing up episode after episode for yeah we were talking about another hbo show which i just finished watching which i won't name and that was my frustration as you get to the end of it and i'm like there is no difference between the good and the show doesn't realize there is no difference between the good and the bad characters. At the end of it, we're supposed to root for one person when they've done these horrible things along the way. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to go, this is the bad person, but actually, et cetera. And it's frustrating because I'm like, I don't think that and this is, I think the writer often writes these things that they're not intentionally morally ambiguous. It's to me, just not really written strongly. And that was a frustration for me as I get to the saying like, wait, they did this thing here and that was horrible. But that was okay because they're our quote hero. But there is, you know, that's yeah. Guys, you're you're yeah. meant to like uh, sympathize with Dory, especially in season one, right? Like she's kind of directionless. She's between jobs. She doesn't really know what she wants to do, and so you get a lot of affection for her. And then it's through season two and especially season three where you realize no, she's like making bad decisions. She is she is a bad person and. This, I, I guess that's, that's, that's the thing is that there were all these elements where, you know, there's entertainingly people are making these selfish decisions. They are selfish characters pretty much above, uh, uh, above everything. And I found that interesting and hilarious. Uh, and, and then, you know, there's, there's a line for which I couldn't, I can't uncross as a viewer where I'm like, Oh wait, you're all irredeemable. Like I, I now before, yeah, you're selfish. You know, you 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 do these things that are that are mean or bad. Uh, but it's ha ha ha. Look how, uh, uh, how much you know that one character has the worst moment of his life and immediately goes to his ex and patches everything up and then gets a call saying that there is like now a rebound. And is immediately in his clothes and out the door, <laughs> like seconds later. It's like, ah, ha, ha, what an awful selfish person you are. And now it's like, oh, I feel, I feel terrible. I feel terrible even seeing you guys walk the streets. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's so that's we'll that's frustrating. Like we'll I, we'll I see. like ambiguity can be great. Like you take the wire, you know, and you know, it's more about like. Here's this effed up sort of situation, and here's this idea that we need to make things better. Here are the compromises and the character flaws along the way toward the sort of, you know, towards that. You know, and they, that can be neat. You know, you can start off with, like, you know, Sopranos, a character that is obviously, it starts off with bad guy. Now we're going to show you the life of a bad guy mm -hmm. and make you sympathetic to him, but bad guy. Yeah, and like well, with the yeah. Sopranos, they constantly had to remind people, no, he's the bad guy. He's not supposed to yeah. be the cool guy that you like idolize. Well, because because that's a great antihero story. But it's like to me, you know, a uh, uh, search party went from a new version of Veronica Mars, and then kind of just on a dime said, "Oh no, we want to be the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret." Yes, except with like stakes. Yes, and yes, like yes. real stakes and emotional stakes, and I'm like. I like both those shows. I love Veronica Mars. I love the increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret. If they just changed into each other, I'd be like, whoa, no, these are yeah. two totally. I have to have a certain distance to watch 
the devolution. I uh, yeah. I like the fact that you positioned uh, increasingly poor decisions of Todd Margaret as a show with no stakes, considering that the second season <laughs> begins say? with him about to hit the red button to launch well, a nuclear device. Sure, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but but just you know, be, but you don't care about Todd. Right, like, that's like right, the funny right. the funny part is that he just spins like a top, and you're like. Oh, you, what irascible stuff are you going to get into now? But that's the point, right? Yeah. Is like, how did he get himself into this situation? Uh, where, like, you know, in, in Search Party, it's it's just like, oh, no, like, I kind of, you see negative elements of yourself in all of the characters. And then they do something horrifying and they're like, oh, okay, well, I guess what I was supposed to take from this is that... <laughs> This is how. All right. Anyway, the more we go into yeah, it, it's like, going to be faster. That was yeah. like Seinfeld was great because they're if they're awful. If you realize, a lot of people didn't realize they're awful. They're like, oh, I feel like I'm an Elaine, or I'm like, no, you. If you really understood Elaine, you would never want to call yourself that, you know. But you can enjoy it. And at the end, last episode, and that's why you know it was like it's like you know, hey, yeah, Khaleesi's a monster, and Seinfeld, like, yeah, no, they're bad guys. You you didn't notice this. And it wasn't a progression. They've all it's always been there in front of you, and like, and then they do a reveal, and then you go. Some people are like what, and then you're like, oh, you're like, yeah, this is about bad people, but they're likable. Uh, speaking like, of bad like people us. who are likable, my picks are, and I I think we talked about them last week of uh, Terminator one, two, and three. Uh, boy, is it fun to show those movies to somebody who is totally unfamiliar with the franchise like like to have one story told to have a reversal of the second story told and the third one play with the remix of it uh i, I enjoyed it quite a bit yeah third one like of all of the post t2 sequels is the one that i think is arguably the most coherent and i think consistent yes i enjoyed it, it was moscow and like that's in a spoiler, like the end part, we're in the bunk, you know, and they're in that yeah, you know, world, it, that, the Cold War bunker. Crystal it's a Mountain. Great thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. great. There was a lot of, a lot of it, it, it aged. I'm sure aged since I saw it in the theaters. Like, I think I watched like a year or two ago, but yeah, it was consistent in that. Like, the idea of like, oh, I was going to be the savior, and now I'm just this, you know, loser and that stuff. Like, I, oh, yeah, T3 doesn't get the respect it deserves, except here. Yep. Right here. A hundred percent. We are, we stand T3. <laughs> yep. Andrew, you got a pick? Right. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So my pick is I've been, I, and I'll probably keep talking about it, but I've read it. I've listened to it before. And now I'm doing a much more sort of slower sort of, you know, dive into this. And that is Isaac Asimov's foundation. Oh, and nice. The, you know, the book is, it's, you know, one of the considered one of the, the big classics of science fiction, you know, deals with this far future galactic civilization facing collapse and a psycho historian trying to prevent the collapse by creating this this basically this sort of group that's going to preserve knowledge and sort of try to restart, you know, civilization sooner than later. And it's a neat premise. You know, Isaac Asimov read The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire and decided to sort of do sci fi version of that. I, I am enjoying it very much. The version I'm reading, I think, is Scott Brick, who does a lot of great sci-fi stuff. It is the first ones. The first ones are incredibly dated when you listen to the language where it's like, I don't think we've heard a female character speak yet. Like, I don't <laughs> think we've heard a female character speak yet. And and they talk about like, well, how many psycho historians do you have? Like, oh, you know, we have, you know, one, you know, 50,000 men and then their wives and children. And you're like, well, that's, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, this future's uh a lot like 1950, you know, and yeah. so and, it, and it's it's some books, you know, you know, some things you are you can kind of it's easier to sort of go like ah trying, but here it is there is that, but that's what I'm like. They're doing the Apple version, which I think is neat because they've rewritten and re I'm, I don't know how that's turned out, but you can see that some of the characters they've they've, they've switched genders and stuff for that, and I think it's a great choice because that book as it is right now. I I don't want that to be the world's introduction to foundation is you know a literal version of this where women aren't scientists and stuff. So uh, yeah. but the book itself, look, read it through the lens of that and you know the the the, the you know the you know not saying accept the misogyny or whatever from that and then acknowledge it and then focus on the bigger ideas. And it's a very neat idea about like what is knowledge 
what is collapse? How do you realize when things are falling apart? And that's part of what they talk about is like, what does the loss of knowledge look like? And, you know, as you watch things where they have like power plants are exploding and things like this are happening because nobody knows how to maintain them. Nobody has to work them. So it's a lot of really big themes. It's why it's an influential book. So Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Listen to the audio book right now. Nice. Re-listening to it. So. And I will say, I'll contrast it. Ten years, you know, like a decade later, Frank Herbert wrote Dune. Very strong female characters. You know, the Bene Gesserit, what have you. There were some strong female characters in there. And they're doing the Dune movie. Uh, Dennis Villanueva uh, uh, is doing that movie. And they're actually going to be doing a TV series, uh, The Sisterhood of Dune, which is going to be, I think, about the Bene Gesserit and whatever, which I think is a great concept of like, let's take a thing, remember what's important about it, but then tell it. And I think in a language that sort of makes more sense for not modern audience. I'm a fan of and T3 really still rocks. All right, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, it's been after. Any of you guys ever read Foundation? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Foundation. I oh, am and that first... embarrassed to admit that I have not. No, don't be. Uh, that... I think you should be excited. You've you got a really cool, you know, thing to look forward to. That first book is also just, and I almost... Nah, no, nah, I won't even spoil this, but I, I think it it really, really uh, it sets a foundation. Yes, yeah. uh, I yeah. mean it, it. It keys into I think uh, uh, some of Asimov's real strengths in terms of yeah. uh, you know the expanse of his imagination and the relentlessness of history and time marching yeah, like forward. Like what's cool, like Brian, in that first book, the first introduction is that you, you in the world, that future, the, the center of galaxy is the planet Trantor, which is, there is no green space. It's entirely a giant, massive city, you know, that covers the entire planet. And that's in 1950 to be writing, you know, this idea of describing like that mega civilization was sort of a very cool concept. You look at that, like things we take for granted in sci-fi were later on, but back then was sort of cool. Uh, but what's funny is like, he puts the population at it at like, 40 billion because 40 billion would fill up an entire planet you know here we are creeping on 8 billion and like a lot of space around so yeah uh all right well we've got to uh, get ready are you guys doing happy hour today yeah yeah I, I i didn't know i didn't i think we we had discussed maybe taking this week off but we can uh oh we can, uh, we can figure it out we can I'm we'll find out I'll in call 40 you. minutes. Okay. I'll call All you. Right. All right. Yeah. Find out in 40 minutes. Otherwise, join us for Cord Killers up at 6. Andrew, I think you're joining us on Cord Killers. Is that? Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. If you want it, I'll do that. <laughs> please, Andrew. Please join us on Cord Killers. All right. Fine. <laughs> so that'll be up soon. All right, everybody. Have a good one. All right. Uh, 4 p.m. Pacific Cord Killers, right? That's right. Cool. See you then.